have that many people coming in to be in front of you. So to get more people close together, I think is better, don't you? So let's all come together. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to have our, another great session of teaching from Brother Michael Brochier. We have had some full teaching today. Uh, I mean, starting Sunday morning, Sunday night, today's luncheon, our leader's luncheon was just amazing. We're back for more tonight. And so I want to say thank you to everybody for coming out. Let's begin. Let's just go ahead and lift our hands together, pray together. Father, we come now tonight and we thank you, Lord, that you've been moving in our midst with some amazing things. And there's been some of the most amazing breakthroughs in the history of our church. There's been so much, some amazing healing. And we say thank you for everything that you do. Thank you, Father, that we are in a breakthrough season. We are in a season to see the goodness and glory of God. We thank you, Father, that there is no shortage of your great love for us. And I pray for each and every one of us. May we be filled with the love of God. May we be just overflow with the love of God. We say thank you for Pat and Jerry Rico, our apostles from Mexico coming all the way up here. We bless the two of you. We bless the work of God that's going on there. And Lord, we say thank you so much. Let's all worship together tonight. Let's just come into the presence of God. Let's thank the Lord for our worship team. Look at the size of this great team for a Monday night. You guys are all fantastic. And we're going to open up with worship right now. I'll turn it over to you, Pastor Walter. Ready to sing about breakthrough tonight? So I'm gonna praise you, you are the God, you are the God. 
What a powerful name. space between him and us. Amen. It's no more veil. It's, we come boldly before the throne. Oh, Jesus, we love you. We thank you. We thank you, God, that you made a way that no more space between us. I'll dance with you, I'll follow you, I will dance with you, I'll follow you, I will dance with you, I'll follow you wherever you go. Between you and me, there's no more space because of your light and your grace. We can stand face to face. Oh, between you and me, Jesus, there's no more space because of your light and your grace. We can stand face. Your lights and your 
like to receive a new impartation tonight are you ready some need to have an impartation of breakthrough I know that there's a breakthrough anointing here tonight that's going to get released and I just want to encourage if you need a breakthrough anointing just come right up here in the front right here just come on up you say man I want to break through in this next season you come up right now right now that's Walter I'm going to have you pray for breakthrough for people we, we have been in We've been experiencing the God of breakthrough. And I know, man, that opening song, I was thinking breakthrough before I heard that song, you know? Man, everybody's up here for breakthrough. Come on up. Come on up. Just come on up for breakthrough. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, and I, I also want to ask for our ministry, you know, our, our staff ministers and our ministry team and people that are used to ministering. If you want to just begin to pray with people after Pastor Walter prays and then we'll keep singing. I want to release that. If you want to receive breakthrough, you're here tonight. Just kind of wave at me. Let me see who's ready. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you that there's a window and that window is now turned into a door. Thank you, Father God, that, that walls have windows and windows can become doors. And there's a place where we can break through. Thank you, Father God, for the breakthrough anointing that's on Pastor Walter, Pastor Joy. We say thank you for that. Pastor Walter, just begin to release a prayer for everybody raising their hands right now. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, we thank you for breakthrough, God. We thank you that your blood left nothing undone, Father. We thank you. We thank you that your blood took care of everything, God. Father, I thank you that right now, each one, God, that's surrendering to you right now, and each one that's saying, God, this thing needs to be dealt with. This thing has got to see some breakthrough. Father, right now, I pray that you would release an anointing and a flow from your spirit right now, God, where every wall, every wall comes down in Jesus' name. Father, you can walk through the walls, God. So come right now. I speak breakthrough. I speak breakthrough by the blood of Jesus. By the blood of Jesus. Father, Father, breakthrough. Oh, I speak breakthrough. I speak breakthrough. Oh, I speak breakthrough. Oh, I just, I 
just have this vision of Adam laying, laying in the dust and God had formed him. God had the vision for him. But not until the breath of God came did he become. And I think part of our breakthrough is a fresh wind of God to blow into our nostrils. That face-to-face encounter where he says, I'm, be- I'm making you into the dream I had before I even knew you in your mother's womb. God, I speak breakthrough of breath right now. And many have lost their breath. Many have lost their breath running and trying and striving. But God is restoring it right now. God is restoring the breath right now. Fresh wind blow. Fresh wind blow. We love you, Jesus. Fresh wind blow. Breakthroughs. Breakthroughs. Fresh vision. New vision. Open our eyes that we can see. Open our ears that we can hear. Fresh vision. A new season with a fresh vision. A new season. Father, I thank you for new anointing from heaven to be released into each and every one of our lives. A new anointing that gives us breakthrough power. A new anointing that overcomes every obstacle. A new anointing, a stronger anointing, coming greater, coming greater, coming greater, rising up within you, even stronger, even stronger, and even greater, and even greater. We say increase work of Holy Spirit. Increase the work of Holy Spirit in our lives. Each and every one of us here, we want more of the work of the Spirit. We want the wisdom of God. We want the power of God. We need the glory of God. We say, release us into a new season. around them just start prophesying over them blessing mexico right now bless them in the name of jesus we're going to keep ministering over here as well keep singing as well this is a time to receive 
This is the time that we assemble before God and say, Lord, I want to receive something new from you. Lord, we want something new from heaven. Come on up. Come on in and receive. We don't want to wrap up till you get what you came for. Kelly, are you okay back there? I think God's all over you. We need some of you just minister to sister right there. Just see, that's the glory. Just come over and minister. Oh, come on in. And Cindy and Chuck, jump in. Come up and jump in. If you want prayer, get prayer. If you want to pray, you can pray. If you want to stay there, Miss Suzanne, whatever you want to do, if you're comfortable not jumping in, you don't have to.
needs to fade Your plan right from the start was hard to heart And face to face Your plan right from the start on the team you know sometimes the ministry team does all the ministry and they don't get any of the benefits and they say we need some benefits over here I got my benefits. amen and so Lord we just lay hands of blessing upon Pastor Walter this night for the doors of 5778 to be made open wide that there's doors of blessing and there's doors of joy there's doors of purpose and there's doors of opportunity that you will see people through doors I see you seeing people through doors and you're like I need to go through this door to reach this person and God is going to put people in your life and they're going to be people that you're going to reach and change and transform and I see you drawing people in and people you're going to have an eye to see what they see you're going to have a heart to know what their heart is longing for and you'll go through the door to take them by the hand and then you will take them through new doors of their life and you will be making people into disciples you're going to be making people into followers of Christ that are going to move into destiny and there is this season where I see those longing and looking for you you will see them and you will reach them and I bless you with new opportunities of people to be touched and changed and transformed I see young musicians aspiring ones those that hunger and say could we do this too those that long for the fire of God and those that long for those seasons in the presence of God and that you'll pour from your life and they'll say can we drink from the cup that you drink from and you would say I will pour my cup that you may drink and as you pour your cup even the new young Davids and the new young minstrels and the new ones will come forth and they will say we long to have this heartfelt presence heartfelt fire we bless you to go through new doors new doors new doors new doors Isn't it nice we can just come in and not be in a hurry? Let's thank the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. I want to ask the Ricos if they'll come over and, and stand by me here. Come on over, Pat and Jerry. We want to honor you in the house. Let's give a big hand for our apostles from Mexico. Come on over. And we've been walking together I don't even know how long now maybe 10 years or more but it's just been such a blessing and you had an amazing breakthrough that you were telling me about today at our leadership lunch and I'd like you to tell everybody about what God has done in the prison there with AIU okay well what happened is uh, some of you may or may not know that I am involved in prison ministry and I love going into prisons, even though I've never been in one on the bad side of it, but so, <laughs> praise God, God there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so I go to the, the, she's like the director of education for the local prison there, and I present AIU to her, and so she starts asking me a lot of questions, you know, well, what about graduation? You know, where are you going to do that? I says, well, our goal would do it in a really nice hotel, but I think we'd have to do it special here, because you won't let them out. 
<laughs> yeah. So she exactly. smiled and like a little sense of humor there. But then uh, she was asking a lot of questions, and I answered all the questions. At the end of the uh, the interview, she says, "Are you uh, interested in doing Puerto Penasco as a pilot program for the whole state?" And I'm like, "Okay." So she says, "She says, well, I'm going to introduce it to the state." education system and we'll get a response from them in a week or so so just be you know waiting on our response and I'm like okay so she calls me in a week she says you've been approved by the state for for all of the state prisons wow. so before I leave her office she says I like the program so much um, I, I want an application for me also come on so, so, you know, we're just believing that, that the Lord's going to open up the doors. They did give us a little bit of a hiccup. They, they always put like that little speed bump in the way. But, you know what, we got that taken care of. Amen. So we're not worried about Beautiful. it. Beautiful. Let's thank the Lord for them again. Let's, let's all extend our hands. And, Father, we say thank you for opening the doors of AIU and, and our directors here. Uh, Pat and Jerry almost called you doctor. Must mean you got to get that, okay? So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so we'll, we'll call you doctor when you get that one. And, but Father, thank you, Lord, that the doors have opened into Mexico for Ascend International University and that the favor of God is there. And we bless this couple as they go. And, and Lord, we pray for all of our translation to be taken care of properly. All of all the things that need the, the T's crossed, the I's dotted that are necessary, that we will have graduations in the prisons in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, tonight is an AIU night, and this is why we're about to have two hours of teaching and training. And some of you may say, I'm not sure what Ascend International University is. We have these brochures up here that we want you to be able to pick up, learn more about it. But you can receive a leadership degree. You can receive a bachelor's leadership, a master's, or a doctorate. When you get your doctorate, you will be writing and publishing your own book. And we walk you through that process. And so all that is connected to a National University. Some of you may say, but I'm not a pastor. I don't work at a church. I'm glad you don't. I want you to be in the marketplace. I want you to prosper where you're planted. I want to see God's glory on your life so that you can know how to take the ways of God and the principles of God wherever he's planted you and be a student at AIU, be able to graduate, be part of our graduations, and it's just an amazing thing. We have an, a pastoral track and our pastoral degree. If Pastor Sam and I and others, Pastor uh, Dr. Lorraine, we've talked about this that if you will take all the classes in our pastoral track, we believe that you can be a successful leader. You must be called to God. You need to obey God. But if, if there's information you need, it is in this pastoral track. Whenever you attend our AIU classes, we receive a love offering for those that are that you're just visiting, you're, you're benefiting from the information. And those that are in the school, you're, you're paying for the, the classes as you're taking each class. But here at the Goodyear campus, this is what we call AIU Central, and we are opening up satellite campuses in Mexico, in the African nations, in other nations where there are literally hundreds of pastors asking us, will you train us? And so every time you come and participate in our classes, you're, you're creating an atmosphere because it's really the hunger of the people that pulls out of the instructor. And you're creating an atmosphere for all of our classes that, that will go online to have a maximum anointing. And even as you give in the love offering like we will receive tonight, you may say, well, you know, I, I'm not in it for a degree or something, but could you sow for AIU to have the resources that are necessary to get things translated, to put things online? There, there's a lot of work and a lot of money involved for AIU to provide this quality education even for those in other emerging nations. And you're a part of that. You're sowing into something far greater than even this one class tonight. So let's stand together with our offering, and we're going to receive a love offering. You'll be able to just come up and put it in the plates. But, Father, we speak a blessing over AIU. We thank you, Father God, for Dr. Lorraine, that is, as our dean, that she is working so hard with so many others. And, Lord, I pray that you would put a desire in students 
hearts tonight to say, I want to be a student. I want to get my degree. I want to graduate from Ascend International University. We pray, Father, even as Jared has gone into two different African nations of Kenya and Uganda, that, Lord, in those nations, pastors are taking applications, and they are now joining our, our student body in these nations. Now we have favor in Mexico, and there's this movement going on in Mexico. So, Lord, in all these ways, we say thank you for what you're doing in AIU. We speak a blessing over Ascend International University for this new year. Breakthrough for AIU. Breakthrough for AIU. And, Lord, we ask now, Father God, for you to do this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As you bring your offering up, you can pick these up. These are here in the middle section. And you will see these brochures are our future instructors as well. So if you can put your offering in any one of the baskets, it's greatly appreciated. Got some cardinal gear coming up. You go lay hands on Brent in the back. He's got a, he's got a car, Cowboys jersey on. Okay, would you just... Cast that demon out. All right. founder of pastor's coach he has been in ministry for over four decades i think you said so you started really young got saved in 1977 was when you started 75 i'll let you straighten the dates out but i mean you've you've seen the movements of god and everything else and this man wants to see us make disciples how many of you want to see disciples to fulfill the great commission amen and, and so even as you, when you wrap tonight, we'll have a break at 8. We'll have a 15-minute break. You can go into the back, pick up, uh, you can pick up books uh, during the break. And then we'll close about 5 till 9. And I just want you to release a corporate blessing for us to receive that impartation from you to make disciples. How's that sound? Let's give a big hand to our guest instructor tonight, Michael Brozier. Hi. Is everybody alive and well? Wow. Well, we uh, began last night with a little bit of focus on leadership, and we're talking about a specific model of leadership called apostolic servant leadership. Is something wrong? No, you're, you're right, but our, the board's are wrong. When you, when you want to use the whiteboard, we'll move it in. It's blocking the screen. Right oh, bama. Okay, well, we can actually move it over there right, right, right now. Do you want my help? Okay, great. All right, so it just helps to have a board around, you know. White board, you know, helps me to. That helped for, can you guys see it now? Yes. And then the side people got side screens. You guys. Okay, so here's the clarification of my story. I'll start with a little bit of my story since I didn't give you any last night. But um, I actually was raised in a hippie house. My parents were drug takers in the city of San Francisco during the uh, 60s and 70s. I was raised in that world. I heard, never heard about Jesus until I actually started hitchhiking around the nation. And actually one of my favorite spots was to Flagstaff, Arizona, where all the freaks hung out. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, 
up on San Francisco Peak, li- sitting in teepees, eating peyote. And anyway, that was my, my world. But it was on one particular, and that was when I first started hearing about Jesus because Christians would pick you up hitchhiking and you, they had a captive audience. And so they would share the gospel with me and uh, that was all like, you know, 72, 73, 74. At the end of 74 was when I first prayed to receive the Lord. I had six rides in a row with believers and then (coughs) the last one let me out on uh, on a little town called Boonville and uh, this car pulls up and literally it was like the most infamous Jesus freak (laughs) near my house. And uh, a woman named Sabina Ball, who was just a phenomenal woman of God, who became my mother in the Lord. Uh, she witnessed to me for 25 miles, and then at the end of that time, she said, Vel, would you, she was from Germany, would you like to pray with me? And I said, well, I don't know, yeah, sure. So I prayed, and actually something happened. And that was just amazing to me. Um, it, it was about a year later that I really started walking with the Lord, but I started having revelations of Jesus. I had an amazing encounter like two, two weeks later where I saw the Lord. And then um, about a year later, I was hitchhiking up to a big hippie gathering called the Rainbow Gathering up in Montana. And I was led out on a Blackfoot Indian reservation. And the Blackfeet, uh, you know, they didn't like the hippies very much, but this one particular guy, I met him at the general store. His name was Tiny Man Heavy Runner. And he basically, you know, helped me out. And finally, you know, we couldn't find the, the gathering, so he took me to his house, and I spent the night in his tent. Actually, it was a teepee. And uh, he was a student and a teacher of the Indian way. I thought, wow, this is it. God wants me to learn the Indian way. And so I, and, but the next morning I woke up and met his grandparents, and uh, they were believers. They were in their 70s. They had come to the Lord. They, had actually, they were actually born at the turn of the last century, in the around, you know, 1900s. They had come to the Lord in the 40s through a personal visit of Jesus. Wow. He actually was losing his stomach lining. He had, uh, had bad liquor. You know, he, he was raised in mission schools where they made him eat soap if he spoke in his native tongue. And he just hated Jesus. And he was drinking himself to death in a bar. And uh, Jesus appeared in the bar and everybody saw him. <laughs> and he was standing on a table and people started freaking out and running out of the... And uh, anyway, he turned to the man and said, you know, sober up and follow me. And then he turned to his wife and said, uh, fast for four days and your husband will be healed. And so these people had had seven visits of Jesus throughout their life. And they had had a tremendous healing ministry from like Great Falls up to Calgary, just all in that region. And, um, and so I lived with them for six months and just saw incredible miracles. I heard the audible voice of God. I, I just had these incredible encounters, this long-haired hippie kid who um, I was too cool to even have a backpack. I had this nice bag, and uh, I didn't even have a sleeping bag. I had a Gandalf cape. Like, you guys saw the Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the capes from Lothlorien. I had one made for me so I could just curl up and disappear under a freeway on-ramp. And, and um, anyway, but that was my, and then after six months, they said, hey, you know, we can't help you anymore. You need to go get trained. So I went to, back to San Francisco area and began checking out different Bible schools. And that's when I heard about this group in Northern California that was planning churches. And they were going to plant a church in my home city, San Francisco. And that's when I went up there. I applied, and I was able to go into their training process. But they didn't believe in a lot of classroom training. I mean, they did, they did classroom, but they were actually an apprenticeship program. So they wanted to teach you in the process of ministry. So I was there with them for six months and went through that training. But then they sent me down to the city with about 15 other people in the September this, this month. <laughs> September of 1977, 40 years ago, wow. was when I started ministry in the city. And I was, a, you know, I was still pretty young and raw, but it was probably in about the next year that the Lord spoke to me to unify his church. So I'm a long-haired hippie kid, you know, 20 years old, a little scruff on my chin. And uh, so I went to every pastor in San Francisco to get them all together to do a big worship thing together. And um, it was in the, that point where actually one of the pastors I talked to said, well, I'll do this with you if you go out on the streets with me next week. 
And so it was actually two weeks later. But two weeks later, we all brought about 80 people out onto the streets and started sharing the gospel and inviting the presence and the power of God. And we started seeing miracles and, you know, salvations. And uh, this was now 1977, 78, 79. And then it got really big. You know, we started to, we did this thing, we organized into a thing called SOS Ministries. And I went all around the country, you know, hung out with Keith Green and David Wilkerson and Jack, Jack Hayford and all these guys went to Washington for Jesus, if any of you remember that, and uh, Jesus People USA, and then came back to San Francisco, and, and 500 people gathered for this outreach, and, uh, and my wife was one of them. And she was a YWAMer, and so she came to the outreach because a mutual friend invited her, and, uh, and um, it was pretty awesome when I you know, actually to quote a Beatles song, you know, my heart went boom <laughs> when I crossed that room and I held her hand in mine. No, I didn't hold her hand. That was, that was a little, <clears throat> she was just seven, now she was just 19. But um, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and the way she looked was way beyond compare. <laughs> but anyway, so it was, it was, pretty much love at first sight. I asked her to marry me in two weeks. Actually, it was, it was that night um, on the streets. We, we gathered a bunch of people just to worship on the corner of Castro and Market, which is the epicenter of the gay community. And we were just worshiping Jesus there. And uh, these guys that were dressed as nuns uh, called the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Uh, they were dressed as nuns with white face, with beards, and with fishnet stockings and, you know, four-inch high heels. Well, they went down through all the bars and, and emptied the bars out with all these half-drunk or some fully drunk uh, gay men who came up and got pretty angry at us and started, you know, so we were, my wife and I held hands at a riot on the first day we met. And the riot was pretty intense, and it started getting violent, and so I just said, Diane, you got to help me go. You know, we're going to run over and open up the church. It's about six blocks away. And just as we were standing there right at the curb waiting for the light to change, her hand touched mine. Uh-oh. And I was in a very strict ministry, but gosh, you know, <laughs> I grabbed her hand and just kind of gave it a little tug, and that was it. I had to marry her, you know. I didn't want to, didn't want to defraud the girl, you know. And now we have seven children, and... And we're still married, which is awesome. <laughs> it wasn't an easy go, but 37 years is what we're nearing on. But anyway, so that's a little bit of my story. But again, being in San Francisco, you know, as I said last night, you know, we had just so many amazing seasons of outpouring in the Holy Spirit, some of the most outrageous, phenomenal healings, words of knowledge, incredible things. But we also, you know, just being aligned with John Wimber, really sort of set this other thread in me as well. You know, I had this, the thread of the Holy Spirit. I mean, seriously, the first conference I went to with John Wimber, this impartation came on us. And my wife was like, well, I don't know if we're going to believe this. You know, if, if it doesn't happen at home, we're not going to really go for this. So we went home, and I was just in a small room sharing a testimony. The girl in the front row falls out of her seat and starts slithering across the floor screaming with demons. I mean, we're just talking like we didn't intend anything. And anyway, she got set free and the Holy Spirit began to move and, and we became known as the Ghostbusters. It's like, <laughs> seriously, like everybody came to us and, you know, the, 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 the next person we prayed for, this woman from Hong Kong who had been ra- born in Hong Kong, raised mostly in the U.S., but she had just given her life to Jesus and all hell broke loose in her life. I mean, she, her job was turning against her. She had objects flying across her house when she lived alone. She had bite marks on her back and scratches. And it was just a horrible situation. And as soon as we started praying for her, full-on demonic manifestation. And we prayed for her for, gosh, I think probably three or four hours that day. We had a couple of friends with us and n- nothing. Ha- I mean, we could get the demons to talk to us, but we couldn't get them out. I don't know if you, how many of you ever cast out a demon? It, it, it adjusts your whole, you know, theology when you actually encounter a real full-on manifestation like that. And uh, gosh, you know, we just didn't know what to do. I mean, we tried everything. It's like, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. I mean, we tried every <laughs> emphasis on every syllable and we just couldn't get anywhere. <laughs> And, uh, and finally, we just said, God, we need your help. We just sat down. And, 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 and so the Lord gives my wife a number of words in Chinese. <laughs> and they're like 10 syllables. 
and they're written in English, but they're, they're, they're phonetically Chinese. And so she just kind of reads them off, like, I don't know what's going on, but I'm seeing these words, and she reads them off, and it's the girl's mother's maiden name. <laughs> And it turns out that she went home and asked her mom, well, what, was, what, what gives, you know, what happened around that time? And basically the short story was her mom had gotten pregnant from a very wealthy kid, and he was honor-bound to marry her, but she started to lose the child. So she went to the temple and made a deal. And that's how this girl was demonized for her whole life. And so we just started casting out demons right and left and just had some amazing fun in the city. When the lights go down. No, anyway. <laughs> Sitting by the dock of the bay. <laughs> you know, I left my heart. No, San Francisco. It's not, quite, it's not quite New York, you know. I thought San Francisco was the center of the universe until I went to Times Square. And I realized, okay, I, I humble myself, you know. It's like, you deserve it. Anyway, let's get into the word, okay? Let's do it. Okay, so... What we're doing is we're kind of halfway through the, uh, the teaching on, hang on, where am I? Okay. Gosh, somebody enlarged these. What a blessing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. I don't know where I am, though. Okay. A new paradigm. Let me just get back to where we need to be. Am I going backwards? Okay. No, I know, but then I go here. Oh, that's not good. We're all together, together, waiting here as one. Okay, let's hold on for a second here. All right, I, I probably need some help from the sound booth because I think I flipped into your, uh, your song list. <laughs> I left my heart in San Francisco. But this is starting in the back end, so how do I get it up to the front? Okay. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, no, I think we're good. All right, so let's, let's just go. Let me, um, let me just get to the right page to, right now. <clears throat> okay, so we were on culture, and um, what I wanted to talk about, I think, starts actually here. So culture is a very, very important thing. Okay, and I believe it's one of the keys to building effective apostolic servant leadership models in your church. And remember last night I talked about the power of culture and how to harness culture. That culture is like a river, and if you can build your riverbanks and steer them, you can actually guide people to where you want them to go without having to micro-lead every single person. But culture is a tricky thing. It's, you know, culture happens no matter what you do. I don't know if you guys know that. That culture is constantly self-generating around us. And, you know, if, if, if we all got in a, in a bus and took a trip to New York City, okay, by the time we got there in four or five, six days, we would have our own jokes. We would have little, uh, you know, we, we would share money together, you know, and bought each other dinner. We would have shared gas. We would have, uh, we would have had our own economy. We'd have our own government. Somebody would be taking the lead on things. There would be a whole cultural manifestation because we took a trip together. You guys understand that? We'd have a set of values in common. You know, we'd have problems that we'd have to resolve that a culture would have generated just from a six-day trip. So every church is constantly generating culture. It's just a very, very normal thing. The question is, are you generating the culture you intend to generate? Or is your culture being generated by accident? Because if it's being generated by accident, then you're missing out on one of the most incredible power sources of apostolic leadership that you could have in your church. Because if you're letting other people in your church dictate what your culture is, and that's the challenge that we have with either conversion growth, where people come to Christ out of the worldly culture, or they come to Christ, uh, they come to our church from some other church, they're going to carry their culture with them. And they're going to impose that culture upon you without even realizing it. And what's going to happen is, is they're going to dilute your culture or even pollute your culture without you knowing it. And so it's so essential as leaders... And this, this is true, and please hear me. Everything I'm about to say to you applies not only in church, but it applies in your family. Amen. When you're raising kids, it applies in your workplace. Yeah. It applies in every single arena of life. That you can, you can transpose the things I'm about to say in a church context to almost every other area of life. This is not just 
church leadership. This is kingdom leadership that we're talking about. Okay, so culture is a crucial dimension. And so as we look at this, culture is based in values. Let me just show you something. Um, I don't know, you guys know who John Wimber was, right? I don't know if most people don't know that John Wimber was actually the founder of a rock band. I won't try to sing it. No, maybe I will. It's called the Righteous Brothers. Do you guys know that? You never close your eyes anymore. You've lost that love and feeling. Okay, he left the band. He got saved and left the band right before that song was published in 1964. And uh, he was already incredibly well known. He was a lounge lizard. I mean, he was the guy who played the piano or the saxophone, you know, it's like he was that guy and he pulled this band together and actually that was, so he knew thousands of people. In his first three years of following the Lord, he led over 3,000 people to Christ across lunch tables. I mean, this guy was anointed from the start. And, uh, you know, he went to Bible school. Then he took over the, the evangelical Quaker church that he was saved in. And the church, I think, doubled or tripled in size. And that's when Peter Wagner saw him and said, hey, you know, you need to come on board with me. You have a knack for building churches. Come on, let's do something. So he, they were just forming the Fuller Institute of Church Growth at the time. He asked John Wimber to be the president. So John stepped into that role, and for five years he worked with Peter Wagner. They traveled all over the world. They interviewed 40,000 churches is what he told me. 40,000 churches where they did essay, you know, uh, assessments and interviews on these churches. All different denominations, different nations, different sizes. And so he became an expert in the science of church. And one of the things that he talked about was how to build church from the inside out. See, he wasn't so much of a Madison Avenue church growth guy. Like send out a mailer and you know, have the slick video and you know, um, you know, shorten your service so that you don't inconvenience people. You know, he wasn't that guy. He was the guy who said basically, no, there are predictable sociological realities that govern the way that we do leadership in life together. And, and, and he said that they were able to actually distill some of these things into principles. And so when he got filled with the Holy Spirit, I think it was in 1975, and he actually was called out of Fuller Institute, and he started Calvary Chapel Yorba Linda with a, you know, that's about the time that he met Lonnie Frisbee. And then Lonnie ended up releasing the Holy Spirit in a powerful way, and Wimber got touched. And Wimber just had such a natural gifting in the Holy Spirit that he began to do classes at Fuller with theologians from all over the world and released the power and the presence of God upon these guys. And so, so Wimber, and then it was, it was at one of the Calvary Chapel, because he was a Calvary Chapel pastor, it was one of the Calvary Chapel pastor's conferences where, again, the Holy Spirit just began to move powerfully. Chuck Smith was just not into it. And so he asked John Wimber to, to separate and, and start something. There was a sub-movement already existing under Calvary called the Vineyard, about 10 churches or so. And, and um, Chuck suggested, well, why don't you take the Vineyard and run with it? And that was a church that Bob Dylan was going to and Keith Green had gotten saved in. It was, it was a pretty prominent movement under a guy named Ken Gullickson. I'm giving you a little bit of recent Jesus culture church history, if you don't mind. All right, so, so anyway, so Wimber ended up you know, becoming the leader of the, of the Vineyard Movement. I think it was in 1981, uh, maybe around 1982 or so. But it started with about 20 churches, and then it just began to grow from there. We joined in 1984. I met Wimber uh, in the, at the end of 83. And so, and uh, it was just, you know, it was just sailing at that time. It was just really building momentum. But when, so I went to this one conference with 2,500 people uh, near Disneyland in, in Southern California, and it was just incredible. And the power of God was moving, and people were getting out of wheelchairs and getting set free from demons. It was just a, an incredible, amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And um, I, I signed up for the next conference on church planting, and I, expected, I walked into the room and expected 2,500 people. 25 people showed up. So I got a whole week with John Wimber and Bob Fulton talking about church planting. And I was already committed to church planting. I'd already been a part of a church plant. I was part of a movement that believed in church planting, but we didn't know what we were doing. We were just trying to figure it out, and Wimber actually knew how to do it. And so this class that he did was just like blowing my mind. And it wasn't long before I said, hey, I gotta walk with this man. Okay, so what I'm gonna show you is one of Wimber's little statements about, uh, he wouldn't call this culture, but he would call it how to build a church from the inside out. So if you just can follow me really quickly, and we just look at this, that basically Wimber said that there's a certain sort of hierarchy or, or foundation and building process within the church world. This, this bottom one is values. Okay, now again, values are, are interesting because we, we don't always know what values are. 
Like we say, well, we have, a value, we have the culture, culture of honor value, or we have, we have a value for evangelism. Those aren't really values. Those are priorities. Okay. A value is an intangible reality by which we judge the relative worth of one thing compared to another. Probably one of the most prominent values in our culture right now, although it's not practiced very well, is the value of authenticity. Integrity is a value. Diversity is a value. Tolerance is a value. See, these values are things that kind of govern how we determine the relative worth of this compared to that. Okay? It's a value system that we have embedded deep within us as a culture. Now, we have that in our worldly culture out here, and some of those values are kingdom values. Some of them are not. But we also have values in our church culture, whether we like it or not or know it or not. And we often have a difference between our aspired values and our actual values. Hello? Because we will say things that we value, but then I say, show, you, show me your checkbook, and I'll see what you really value. Yeah. Or show me your calendar. I'll show you what you really value. Okay, but it's not wrong to have aspired values. I think they're always necessary because we are people on a journey. We're people on a quest for more of the kingdom. So we'll always be longing for things that we have not yet ob obtained yet. Correct? Yes. Okay, so values is number one. Priorities was the next one. And then practices. Okay, now, a priority is what you do on the basis of what your values are. Okay, so why do we worship for an hour on, on a night like this? Why do we pray for people out front? Why do we teach the word in the way we do? Okay, why is it that we have children's church? See, those are priorities. They, priorities are, are the things that we allocate our time, energy, and money, and talent to on the basis of what our values are. So why is the church down the street only worshiping for 17 minutes? Because they don't have a value for what we value. We value the presence of God. And we value encounters with God. We feel like, uh, uh, you know, five minutes in the presence of Jesus is worth, you know, 100 hours of teaching or counseling. You know, we re so we have a certain value base that dictates a certain priority expression. You guys understand that? Okay, so again, it's not wrong or right per se, although you could make a case for one or the other, but the issue is, is, that, is that different values will dictate different priorities, and ultimately your priorities um, are truly manifested when they become practices. In other words, practices are the things that we do without being told. Do we spontaneously share our faith with others? Well, that would indicate that we have a value for inclusion in Christ, Okay, which manifests in a priority of evangelistic commitment and manifests itself in a spontaneous sharing of the gospel in the checkout line at the grocery store. You see what I'm saying? So what do we want our people to do? Do our people, val do they practice fellowship? Do they want to, like, you know, we're, we're launching in this church, we're launching uh, destiny groups coming up. Now, what are the values under that? Well, there's a value for fellowship. There's a value for intimacy. There's a value for family. These are core values that would dictate the, the baseline of what we're doing. Yeah. Okay, I hope you're tracking with me, you guys, because this, this is important, and I'll, I'll tie it all together in just a moment. Okay, but even in family, if your, your nuclear family in your house, your kids or your grandkids or how you work with, you, with your family, there are values that if you build on a values base, you will actually build a very intentional family expression. If you don't, then you're going to allow everything else to dictate your values, priorities, and practices. Because ultimately, this is where culture sits. This is culture. Okay, culture again is your values, your priorities, and your practices, along with your symbols and traditions and expressions that identify who you are in the past and who you are now and where you're going in the future. Okay, it's super essential to understand the power of culture and to harness the power of culture because culture can be an incredibly wonderful asset or it can be a point of confusion and diffusion within anything you're building if you don't monitor culture correctly. Yeah, let's stop there. Is there any questions about this? Yes. Okay, yeah, so culture is a combination of values, priorities, and practices along with symbols, traditions, and expressions. See, language is very central to culture. Guess what music is? 
Okay, I don't think that the church is so much racially divided, we're culturally divided. We have organs in some churches. We have rock bands in another. We have gospel music, which is a different musical form. We have other kinds of, you know, more, let's say, 50s kind of music going on. In certain, you see, it's, it, there's cultural identification, and music can symbolize that powerfully. Okay? Symbols, traditions, and expressions that connect us to our past, identify us in our present, and, and drive us towards our future. Okay, so a wise leader, whether you're leading in a home or a business or in a church, you're going to harness your culture and shape your culture so that you are actually, your culture ends up at the same destination you're driving your organization towards. Do you realize an organization has a destination? Like I said last night, I do not believe that, that, um, that Pastor Greg is actually the architect of this church. I believe that this church exists because it first existed in the heart of God in heaven. And I believe that the reason it exists on earth is because it first existed there. And therefore, if it existed there, then what he's building is dependent upon a blueprint that didn't originate here, it originated there. So I saw the blueprint, and my role as an apostolic leader is to take that blueprint, the best of my ability to read it, and to bring it to the earth, to build a team around it of subcontractors so we can all work together. And if I'm missing something, please tell me, because I want to do it right. But, it, but, if, but we only have one blueprint, and as we build that blueprint over the course of the history of this organization, we are building and manifesting the very destiny of God, but it's an organizational destiny, not a personal destiny. You just get that. We have an organizational destiny here, and that organizational destiny is set into the very uh, uh, presence of a regional destiny. I believe that God is the one who originated Phoenix. I don't believe it was a work of man. I believe that God intended Phoenix. I believe that if we look into scripture, we can actually see that certain geographical reasons and certain population centers actually have angelic uh, oversight. You know, we see that in the book of Daniel where, where Daniel is, you know, interacting with the, the, the principality, a positive principality, not a negative one. See, principality is not a bad word, you guys. Pharisee is not a bad word, okay? Principality was actually just a ruling force. So you can have demonic principalities and you can have angelic principalities, okay? And I believe that God in his heart saw Phoenix and said, I'm going to establish a principality of my government here and it's going to be attractive to people. They're going to come to this valley. They're going to establish homes and businesses. They're going to build culture here by God's intent. But of course, the enemy has also his intentions. And so he has demonic principalities like the Prince of Persia and the Prince of Greece that he will also assign to actually infiltrate trade and to corrupt a certain region. Okay, you guys following me? So in the greater plan of God, so I'm not so much interested in spiritually mapping for the sake of what the enemy wants to do. I want to discover what God's original intention for this region was, and then I want to make sure that as I'm building organization that we fit firmly within the framework of what God intended on a regional level that our infrastructure, our sewage pipes, and our, our power grid actually flows out into the power grid of heaven for the whole region. Wow. You guys understand that? And then on the next level, every person who comes to our church, I know that each one of them has a personal destiny in Christ. And so I want to make sure that I'm matching that personal destiny to our organizational destiny and matching our organizational destiny to our regional destiny so that we can be in complete alignment with heaven for maximized transformation of the region we live in. And that's kind of what I believe the body of Christ is called to do on a regional basis. Amen. That's good. That's okay? Good. And so that's part of what dictates culture for us. Okay. Now, there's two other levels, though. When Wimber was kind of mapping this out, he said this, that there's also programs. Now, in the charismatic world, programs is kind of a dirty word, but it's not a bad thing. Remember I talked last night about the coffee in the cup? Jesus used the word wineskin and wine, but that's not too relevant to us. But a coffee and a cup. We, we need a cup for the coffee, you guys. Programs are essential. Systems and structures are essential to guide anything more than just a single person through life. In fact, I depend on personal structures. 
You know, I have this one seat that I go to when I, after my shower at 6.30 in the morning, I have my cup of tea, I have my Bible, you know, I put on Dappy T. Keys on YouTube because he's got this incredible worship piano music. I don't know if you guys know him. Phenomenal. And I just, I, I have this ritual that I go through in the morning around the word and prayer. See, culture is to community what habit is to an individual. Write that one down. Culture is to community what habit is to an individual. I depend on habits to be the person that I intend to be, and I believe God made us creatures of habit to some extent. If I just you know, went by my feelings any mo given morning, I wouldn't have a prayer life. You know what I'm saying? Culture is to community what that is to me. You guys understand? So culture is like this incredible thing. But culture needs to be authentic first before it's programmatized. Because if you, if you start with programs, which a lot of pastors do and a lot of leaders do and a lot of families do and a lot of businesses do, if you start with programs first, what you end up doing is corrupting. Like, for instance, I, I, I mentioned this a little bit last night, but okay, so Pastor Gary has... Um, church of 200 people, and all of them feel disconnected from one another, but nobody's showing up at the prayer meeting on a Wednesday night, and they can barely get them to church on a Sunday morning, and everybody's complaining with them that they feel so lonely, and they feel disconnected, and they have no friends, and they have no fellowship, and so he gets a great idea. I heard about this small group conference going on over here. I'm going to go to the small group conference. He goes to the small group conference to solve a problem. He looks at the small group material. He gets the small group binder. He comes back home. Uh, he does a little bit of training on small groups. And then he has a small group fair on a Sunday morning. He releases small groups. And in six months, they're all dead. Why? Because they were not based in a core set of values that became priorities, that actually became practices. They didn't care about intimacy and family as a church. And so if you want to shape culture, you've got to start in the basis of your values. Okay? And you've got to re-clarify and recontextualize your values, and then you've got to share those values in a core team and walk those values out with integrity before you start instituting systems and structures. Because system and structures will just sit on top of anything but if they're not sitting on a foundation of true culture, they will fail. You guys understand that? Yeah. All right. So, and then programs, and then finally personnel. Personnel is, is so essential, you guys, that we need to know who, you know, it's like, who's walking with us? Well, they have to have a set of shared values, priorities, and practices, and culture, and they have to believe in the programs we're instituting. They don't have to necessarily be a part of every one, because a bigger church, you know, will have different programs running in different directions, and not every leader can go to every single program. But they have to be able to at least endorse the program as the, as the true manifestation of the culture that we're trying to build, Right? And then at that point, that's when we, you know, we, we have a, a grid for uh, choosing and involving and really joining in unity with our personnel. Does this make sense? Okay, let's stop there. Any questions about that portion? There's a little bit more workshop tonight, so, okay. All right, the only thing I would add to Wimber's incredible py pyramid, yes? Is Uh, it's not in Destiny book, but it's, I think it might be in the, uh, in the Revival Culture book. Yeah. Okay, so the only thing I would add to this is I would add this. Vision. I believe that vision actually sits below. Now, Wimber didn't believe that. I do. I believe that you have to have a heavenly vision. You have to have a blueprint from heaven before any of this becomes ultimately relevant. Okay, and I believe, you know, it's just as I spent time with your, with your, your pastor couple, I've just seen that incredible honed vision. It's getting clearer and clearer as they move forward. But I just feel like that is so fundamental. And then values sit on that in my reckoning. And then beyond that, that's where we go. Okay, so you get the picture of how to build. So anytime you're building in culture, you want to build from the ground up. You want to touch values and priorities and practices first. So whether it's in your business, if you want a different set of behaviors in your business, go to the values of the business first. Okay, and so values are words that usually end with something like ITY or I-C-Y, or N-E-S-S. -S. They're very unusual words, okay? 
But when you understand the power of values, in fact, you can do a value search on, I have, I have stuff in my own uh, files, but if you can go online and just say, give me a list of values. You can get 300 values written out, and then you can kind of choose, well, what are the values most important to me? Okay, so let's just, I'm going to show you. Wow, look at that. It changed already. All right, so how to build a thriving, what, this, this, these are my five values. My five core values. The first one is intimacy. Connection with God and others must be deeply personable, personal and still enjoyable. Okay, I need to be able to connect with people. I want reality. I want honesty. I want openness. I want truth in the inward parts. I want a connection with God. I, wa- I don't want to play games. I don't want to sing about God. I want to sing to God. I want to touch him. I want to be touched by him. I want to touch you and be touched by you. Intimacy is one of my core values. It permeates everything I build. It's the way I lead my leadership team. It's, I just brought on four new, uh, seven new interns and I'm very vulnerable with them. I'm sharing from the deeper places of my life, even though I barely know these guys and they could stab me in the back if they wanted to, but I'm still going to be vulnerable because I value vulnerability as an expression of intimacy. You guys understand that? Okay, the next one is intentionality. Now, Pastor Greg and I have something in common here because we're both very intentional people. I believe that you should never do anything without having the end result in mind. That ultimately, outcomes are important and they really do dictate the best processes to achieve what you're longing for. And so intentionality, pursue the desired outcomes with efficiency, effectiveness, and excellence. These are core values for mine, for me. Okay, and so the next one is integrity. Cultivate maximum consistency between the internal and the external. I want to be the same person on the inside that I am on the outside. Integrity is so important, and I want to make sure that as a church we are too, that we're not just glad-handing people and kind of selling them a bill of goods and not being able to perform what we're talking about. I would much rather see a church under-promise and over-perform than to over, you know, than over-promise and under-perform. I believe so much of the disappointment in the world around us is because there's not, there's a lack of integrity. And again, the world suffers from the same problem, but you notice how much they scrutinize the church. That if, you know, Ted Haggard has a problem, they're all over that. But there's a hundred people within their world that have the same exact problem and they they don't even think of it because nobody's claiming to be anything, but we do. They expect, they judge us by a higher standard and they should, the scripture says they should. Doesn't it? Yes. So we need to walk in integrity. And, you know, again, but the, here's, here's a neat solution, though, is um, nobody likes a hypocrite. Um, but the surest solution to being a hypocrite is just to admit you are one. And then you cease to be one, which is kind of cool. So, <laughs> so to whatever extent I'm being hypocritical right now, please, please just know. All right, so individuality. I really believe that the body of Christ is a product of a thousand million individuals. I believe that it's like, a, you know, we were talking about this earlier at the, uh, at the Ascend International Gathering, but I remember my wife and I went to Neuschwanstein. Anybody ever been there in Bavaria and in, in Germany? And it's just this incredible, it's the, it's the Disneyland cha- uh, castle that Disneyland castle is patterned after. It's just this incredible, you know, spires and t- t- turrets and all these things. And we went there and we actually took the tour and walked all around and then we went into the throne room. And the throne room is basically um, a mosaic of a million stones. And you have heaven being portrayed in mosaic form and then creation and then, and then humanity. And, and it's like it's, it's all there and you're just like blown away. That it's, and you get down to l- the individual stones and they're all kind of rough. Like they don't look like anything. But you stand back and you see this incredible image. It's the body of Christ. It's a hundred million you know, individuals. Individuality is crucial to my theology. It's crucial to my methodology. Individual, passionately protect the personal destiny of every single team member. I do not want you to do a job. In fact, you know, I said it last night, I believe that delegation without development is a form of exploitation. I mean, any pastor in the world can hand you a broom and, or a, you know, a, a, a sponge and say, clean the toilet. But if I'm not willing to stand with you and develop you into your destiny, I shouldn't be utilizing you. Okay? Now, again, that's, that's a harsh way to say it, but you guys understand what I mean. In other words, if I, don't have, if I don't have the possibility, a culture of development in my church where I'm leading people from infancy to full, fruitful adulthood in Christ, then, then I've got something really wrong with my leadership style. 
This is more than just a factory where I put you to work. This is a, so interdependency then is the final one. Fiercely guard the unity of the leaders around organizational and individual vision. See, in other words, I want to know that even as I'm celebrating each person's individuality, that I'm also celebrating interdependency, that we cannot ever exist alone, that we are created for community, and that God ultimately brings us into a family. That's why he uses the word body of Christ, that we're members in particular joined together and each part doing its part to actually produce the full manifestation of Christ on the earth. Correct? So these are five core values that undergird then the priorities that I go after. That's why I worship for 45 minutes because I value intimacy. And that's why I have, you know, I'm, I'm bringing the cup for the coffee because I value uh, intentionality. I don't want to play church anymore, you guys. <laughs> I don't want to go through the motions. I don't want to play basketball without a ball and without a hoop. I want to see results. I want to bring Jesus the glory that he deserves. I want to see his kingdom come, his will be done. I want to see the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings. And to whatever extent we are squandering the grace and the blessing of God, just playing church and going through the motions without any intention to produce an outcome, God forgive us and empower us and anoint us to be much more focused. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's shocking to me. Like you think about, okay, if, if every single person is a believer today, led one person to Christ this year, and then next year, every single person who's a believer led one person to Christ in a whole year, and then the third year, it would take four years to win the entire world. Like, this is not that big of a task. Why has it taken us 2,000 years? Because <laughs> we have some issues, you know? <laughs> and, and we don't really understand intentionality all that well. And there's warfare and there's other problems too. But gosh, you guys, it's like, you know, uh, anyway. All right, so you get it. <laughs> let's, just, let's just go one more here. Oops, I gotta go this way. Okay, whoops, how did that happen? Help me. Help me, Jesus. All right, so anyway. Okay, so <clears throat> how to simultaneously serve the organizational goals with the individual goals? Because this is what we're talking about. Did I go a little too far? Hang on one second here. Nope. Okay. The, that it's really essential that as leaders, and this, this applies in the workplace, it applies in your home, it applies in your neighborhood, it applies in the church, that ultimately there are two priorities that we always need to hold in dynamic tension with one another. And one of those priorities is the health of the organization whether it's your family, whether it's the church, whether it's your business, every single entity of communal or, co or common uh, effort and, and involvement has a destiny to it. And it has a set of principles that will either cause it to succeed or to fail. And we are responsible, if God's called us to be part of whatever structure it is, to ensure the health of the organization that we are a part of. Correct? You guys get that? Okay. On the other hand, we have a responsibility to every individual to make sure that each individual is thriving in their chosen lifestyle and the things that their dreams and their vision and their gifting and their God-given design. Okay, so we have this dynamic tension. If we go too far in this direction, we create chaos. We actually produce ill health in the organization by producing health in the individual to an unreasonable extreme. On the other hand, if we focus only on the individual, I mean, on the, on, the, on the organization, then people become basically servants to the organization. One of the scriptures I love is where Jesus said, man was not made for the Sabbath, but Sabbath for the man. Right. See, I don't believe that people were made for the church. I think the church was made for people. Okay, so we have these dynamics. We have basically individual destiny and organizational destiny, and the goal of good leadership is to bring those two into dynamic relationship where it becomes an absolute win-win, a maximized win-win. You guys understand that? Okay, but then the question becomes, which is the cart and which is the horse? Well, I don't think so. I think there is a cart, and I do think there is a horse. All right? I do think that that one needs to be subservient to the other, the question is which is which. Now I believe in most churches around the world that I visited, the tendency of the church is to always put the organization above the individual. And I believe that's wrong. 
I believe that that is the essential watershed from which one side becomes a factory, the other side becomes a family. You guys know what watershed is? A watershed is a, okay, here's the basic understanding of watershed, is if we're looking at the Great Divide, Great Divide, okay, the Rocky Mountains, every drop of water that falls on this side will go into the Pacific, every drop of water that falls on this side will go into the Atlantic. You guys understand, that's a watershed. It's a, and when somebody says that's a watershed issue, it means that you, you know, once you get to that dividing line, it's like it, you go miles apart. I believe that, you know, and I talked about this before, there's three kinds of churches, fantasy, factory, and family. I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But I believe that factory church essentially is where the organization is more valuable than the individual. Now this is hard, and this, is, this challenges me, and I think it's going to challenge all of us, okay? I believe that true family is always that the individual matters more than the organization, but only slightly. And this is the key. See, because if, as I look at it, and this is why I have to be intentional about this, because I have to say, if the purpose of family is a healthy next generation of sons and daughters becoming full-fledged adults and giving birth to the next generation, then I have to say that they are more important to me than what I'm doing right at this moment. But only slightly. Because to the extent that I, I exaggerate that too far, then I compromise the very organization that's designed to create the health that I'm hopefully producing in them later. So I believe it's kind of like, I would probably put it at a 55-45 or at a 60-40 maximum. I wouldn't go 90-10. If you go 90 individual destiny as my primary goal and 10% organizational destiny, you're going to have that chaotic every man for himself dynamic. If you flip that, then you're going to have an oppressive, abusive control structure limiting individual freedom for, you know, shoveling coal into the big machine. So we've got to be able as wise strategists to guard and to guide that, that unique relationship. You guys get what I'm talking about? Stop there. Any questions on this? Okay, so this is kind of the culture. So let's just look at this real quickly then. Okay, so the way you simultaneously serve both is priority one, clarify and commit to the organization's vision and mission. Okay, we have to have that clearly defined. Otherwise, people have no, they have a great excuse for not, valuing the, the organization very highly. Yeah. If you as a leader are failing to give a clear, like, or as a dad or mom, or as a, as a worker in an organization, if you can't give a clear, concise statement of who we are and where we're going, then you are undermining your own success. Okay? So that's priority one. Priority two is to discover and discuss each member's personal destiny and growth goals in relationship to the organization. Okay, so I want to know, uh, first of all, I want to know what the organization's destiny is. Second of all, I want to know the individual's destiny. And then third, develop a life map for each individual that guides their service strategically. So I want to kind of guide their journey through my organization. And so I set it up like that. So I would say that in every church there should be entry level areas of service and involvement that can actually be pretty low risk to us and pretty high yield to them, but it can only be short term because we want to actually get them on a path to their eventual successful fulfillment of God's vision for their life. Okay, and we're responsible for that. That's part of what it means to be a shepherd is to actually create the pathways of developmental movement in people's lives. But we, 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 we often don't think about that until a problem comes up. We're, we've, been, we've been relegated, most of us as leaders in the church, to, to, to crisis management, wow. to putting out fires, that we haven't been on the forward edge of guiding people into their destiny. We've been sort of you know, just dealing with problems as they arise. And guess what? Reactive leadership is always, always, more damaging, more weak, more less productive than proactive leadership. See, proactive leadership always sees an intended outcome, and we build towards that. We anticipate the problems. We're constantly, we provide solutions before the problems occur. But most pastors are so overwhelmed in what they're doing. Most moms and dads are so overwhelmed that we're always throwing a solution at a problem as our primary MO. See, apostolic servant leadership says no. I have a vision. 
I have an outcome, and I'm guiding this process, and I'm anticipating the problems before they ever occur, and I'm creating a momentum of movement, developmental movement, that actually gets us on a course to an outcome. So, priority number four, mentor each leader on a regular basis. See, we have to be able to, if we want to include people into the overall health of the organization, we need friendship, personal, and ministry. And again, you know, I've, I... I sort of celebrate the fact that, that I've, I, I was committed to doing many, many meetings in a week. I don't want to tell you the exact number because it'll make you sad. But, um, but I did a lot, okay, because I figured that making disciples was my primary job. Okay, so I, and, they weren't, and they weren't pastoral, you know, uh, you know, blow your nose meetings. You guys know what I mean, putting out fires and solving problems. In fact, I would relegate that to my, my assistants. My meetings were 90% focused on leadership development, because that's my primary job. Yeah. See, if I was to, you know, I don't like the word discipleship, you guys. We have to stop in two minutes for break. I don't like the word discipleship. I think it sounds harsh. I think that somehow it's gotten loaded with some other baggage that, that doesn't please me that much. So I don't, I don't usually word, use the word disciple or discipleship. I like words like mentoring and coaching better, because I think they are current, and they're very positive words in our culture, whereas discipleship kind of has this sort of scary thing about it, right? So I usually don't use the word discipleship, but I really care about developing people. See, I believe if we actually were to translate Jesus' statements in the Great Commission to now, he would probably be saying something like this, go into all the world and develop people according to their God-given design and destiny and the fullness of who God created them to be and make sure you touch their identity in the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and you immerse them in that identity of who the Father is and who the Son is and who the Holy Spirit is and that you actually train them in every specific way to do everything I've commanded you and to develop others into the fullness of who I've called them to be so that, you know, and I will be with you to do that for the end of the world. That that's kind of the great commission in my mind, okay? People development is the key to the kingdom. So priority number five then is you need to mentor your leadership team on a group basis with vision, goals, and mission. That it's ultimately that we need to have a set of priorities that flow out of our commitment to produce a culture of intentionality that really brings us to a place where we're actually identifying the outcomes we desire and then blending the organizational vision and mission with individual vision and mission so that both are fulfilled in the process of fulfilling each other. All right? It's 8 o'clock and 22 seconds, so I think I did pretty good, Pastor. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so why don't we take a 15-minute break? We'll be back at 8.15, and we're going to plow some ground because I have two full sessions to complete in a half an hour. But anyway, so... Okay, thanks.
All right, you guys, we are, we're five minutes late, and uh, we need to kind of reorganize a little bit, because um, I'm probably going to have to just race through this next page in your notes, for those of you who are the, the note-taking students. So if we can just kind of blaze a little trail through here. So let me catch you up to where I am. Um, this, this whole notion of apostolic servant uh, leadership is that we, we develop imperfect people into powerful leaders. And that's really what, what, what apostolic leadership is all about. See, apostles see the blueprint. We see the organizational blueprint and we build it. We see the individual blueprint and we help to build it. Okay, that's what apostolic leaders do. Is they, see, they father people into fullness and they father organizations into impact. Okay, you guys get that? And so I want to talk a little bit in this next section. Just I'm going to take about five minutes on this, so you've got to blaze with me. But we're going to talk about the greatest overseers had problems developing good leaders. Jesus had problems, didn't he? I mean, he had a hard time. Okay. Paul had some problems, right? He had a bunch of people accuse him and have issues. So leadership at its best with the best candidates for doing leadership have problems because people are essentially imperfect. So the majority leadership development failure is ultimately the overseer's responsibility, except in the case of Jesus who never sinned. But, but I believe that you know, it's easy for us as leaders to look at the people we're leading that are not receiving our leadership effectively and blame them. But I think ultimately, let's say 99% of all leadership failure is the fault of the leader. And the reason I say that is because it's important for you as the leader to know that you are responsible to anticipate the problems that you should have already anticipated and forewarned against before it happens. Because that's leadership. Leadership sees the horizon. Leadership guides people on the journey. Okay? And so it's essential for us, as we, if we want to be great leaders, we have to think ahead. Now, there are those rare cases where something happens that, that bites you and you just didn't even realize it. But in most cases, and, and here's the other reason why I like to say that the leadership is dominantly responsible for leadership failure in any situation, is because it keeps the leader humble. Because it's so easy for us to become judgmental of other people and to ivory tower ourselves. And, you know, I'll tell you something, you know, as a, as a leader, I've led, gosh, thousands of people in churches over the years. And, and um, there's been times where I've made that mistake where I positioned myself in a place where I was uncorrectable. You know, not often, but, you know, there was times. So that's why I think it's essential. Okay, so what does the Bible say about this? Well, first of all, I believe that the key to this kind of leadership is that we need to leave, lead from love. If you look at 1 Corinthians 13, that love believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things, love never fails. That kind of leadership, a leadership that actually loves the people you're, you're leading, that's the foundation of family. You've got to have a foundation of love. And if you don't love the people you're leading, you're going to have a really difficult time leading them in a, in a kingdom way. Okay. And so we have to love them, and, and out of that love comes the service that we're all longing for. So love believes in those that we lead. Love believes all things. Love, becomes, love comes from a secure leader. I think that one thing I love about the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, it says that Jesus, knowing who he was, knowing where he had come from and where he was going, took off his robe and began to wash the feet. In other words, Jesus was so secure in his identity, he had nothing to prove and nothing to demand. And I believe that if we can come into that place of true um, alignment with the Father and true sonship in relationship to the Father, I think that's the place that the best leadership flows out of. Okay, so, uh, and I'm just kind of touching this very lightly as we go, but love is essential for spiritual parenting. Let's just turn here w real quickly one time. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul just gives you this incredible uh, window into his heart for just a moment. And it's just so beautiful, but I, I just have to read it because it captures the heart and then we'll move on to the next, the next issue. But I'm, you know, one of the biggest challenges of being a preacher is turning in your Bible while you're actually speaking. It's, it's just, it's one of those things that I feel like, okay, Lord, why? Why? That's why they created I iPads. All right, so but I'm old school, you know, I like, I like, so here, here it says, Paul's saying this in verse 7, but we were gentle among you as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. I mean, think of that image. That was how Paul saw himself as an apostolic leader. He wasn't some, you know, general commanding the troops. I mean, he did sometimes, but this was his heart. 
And you just feel the tenderness of his heart when he says, so affectionately longing for you. We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and our toil, laboring night and day that we may not be a burden to any of you. We preach the gospel to you and you are our witnesses and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. And, and, as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children. It's just such a beautiful statement of both the mother heart and the father heart of God for the people you're leading. And I think this is foundational. This is the foundational posture of a true apostolic servant leader is that love and that sense of a father mother heart for those that you're leading. So the philosophy issues, we want to talk about intimacy, we want to talk about clarity. So pray for emerging leaders because we, so here's the thing, we know no man after the flesh, the scripture says. I don't want to see you after the flesh and if you're working for me or you're in my church and you're leading and you fail somehow, you fail morally or you fail in some other way, I still want to see you. If you're restored in the blood of Christ, I want to see you according to the new creature that you are and not to the old man that you're putting to death. You know what I mean? I want to see you and believe in you fully. And so, so if you look at this issue, it's like you need to connect with your emerging leaders and know their hearts and know their dreams. I was so surprised the other day when I actually was talking to a pastor and, and this is a pastor of a decent sized church and, and he was talking about a couple of his people in the church. He was talking about his executive pastor. This is a large church. And he's talking about his worship leader. And I asked you, well, what's the dream of your executive pastor? And he said, dream? What do you mean? I said, where did, where did the, what would be their highest mark of fulfillment in Christ? It was like he, he had a blank stare. I, I, we've never had that discussion. He said, this guy's been on your staff for seven years and you've never asked him. What's your dream in God? How could you ever guide somebody unless you knew their destination? their destiny. It's like I believe that we have to tune in to our people's dreams. We have to understand where they're coming from. Okay, so it's important. And then the second thing is you need to guide your emer emerging leaders by helping them create a developmental path. See, it's important that people have a pathway, stepping stones into the call of God in their lives. Okay, and so it's so essential at that point. Now, I talked about this a little bit in, on Sunday morning for those of you who are part of this church, but I basically identify five areas, five areas of, of and I'll write these out really quickly, five areas that I believe every family should supply for its sons and daughters. Okay, and so the first one is, is identity. Okay, so write that down. Identity, T, the next one is community. The third one is maturity. So as a leader, I'm looking to guide people developmentally through these different experiences. <laughs> okay, and then, and then responsibility. Ability. And then destiny. So here's the deal, you guys, is I want to be able to guide people and deposit in their lives a healthy balance of these five elements as a spiritual father or mother. I want to make sure that people are growing in these elements because if they, if they have a solid identity in Christ, they know who they are in Christ and who Christ is in them, and they know what their, you know what their sense of purpose is in the body, then all of a sudden identity secures them in a deep way. But then the next step they need, identity kind of continues from the start to the finish. Okay, but an identity is most crucial in, in kind of a zero to, to one year old you know, life. It's like if you get identity settled when you're young, if you know the love of your parents, you know your family name, you know who you are and who you belong to, then that can actually be a foundation for the rest of your life. But usually it's about two years old that you start learning community because you're a selfish little brat and you need, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but, but you do need to, <laughs> But the whole universe revolves around you and ultimately you need to start realizing that there's other people in the world and that you have to share with them, you have to love them, you have to forgive them, you have to uh, seek forgiveness from them when you harm them, that learning community is essential to real family life together. 
Okay, so that's the second thing. And that probably starts around two years old, continues all the way through life. I've, I still am learning community. You know, I'm married. And so to learn how to walk with my wife and get along with her is just a massive study in community, you know. And then the next one is maturity. And maturity is the ability to actually basically not be self-centered any longer, but to be God and other centered. That's where, that's where it becomes. That's where it begins. But it's not only that. I mean, maturity has a lot of earmarks. Uh, I said you know, on Sunday that maturity is the ability to actually process your pain in the presence of God without becoming a victim on the one hand or an angry, vengeful person on the other hand. See, I believe your ability to process pain in a, in a redemptive, constructive way is key to maturity. And we need to teach people how to do that because it's not natural to people to process pain. The third one I'll say about the issue of maturity is that maturity actually is the ability to give up present pleasure for long-term gain. Okay? And you guys, uh, what time is it? Eh, we don't have time. Okay, but anyway, it's, a, it's an important thing. Make an investment. Okay? It's important. All right, so maturity is crucial, but responsibility is as well. I believe that responsibility is necessary for discipleship. I don't believe you can become a disciple of Jesus without serving others. And if you, and if you think just going to a, sitting in a classroom, I mean, discipleship is way more than sitting in a class in eight sessions. It's really about a lifestyle shift, and, and, and that has to be guided. And that re, I believe that the best context for um, discipleship to happen is servanthood. Because the issues of your life will not come up in a classroom, but they will come up in the process of serving others. And so if you have a mentor with you who you're serving together in, a, in an apprentice and mentor relationship, then you're going to actually have a context for real life involvement. Look at how Jesus discipled this man. He said, follow me and I'll make you a fisherman. They did life together, not just face to face, but they did life together arm in arm, producing outcomes in the world around them. And that's the context in which Jesus himself trained his men. And he had a show and tell uh, methodology where he would actually bring them and immerse them in a, an experience and then talk about it. We tend to talk about it and then try to have the experience later. And that's actually backwards in terms of he, the Hebrew understanding of the human soul. And so I really think that working side by side with somebody is the best context. And so I basically tell people, hey, if you're not serving in our church, I, I really can't disciple you. I'm sorry. You know? But if you are serving, then I can bring you forward. And I told the story about my, my son. Did anybody hear that story? Okay, I better share it right now because it, it has value. Okay, my son was 23 years old when he came to me and said, Hey, Dad, you and Mom used to tell a joke that really hurt my feelings. And uh, you guys, how many of you heard it now? Okay, so about half of you. Okay, so I'll still tell it again. Okay, so anyway, I said, oh, I'm sorry, son. What was it? And he said, well, you know, you used to yell, yell, yell from the living room while you're watching TV after dinner. Hey, honey, don't do the dishes. That's what we had kids for. Okay, and really he was insulted by that. He thought, oh no, my dad and mom basically were, were looking for a, a group of slaves. So they decided to have children so they could enslave us so that we could actually fulfill their dreams, you know? And, and that was really the opposite. I mean, there's nothing farther from the truth in terms of my motivation to, you know, engage his mom and to marry her and to build a family with her. It was, you know, I had this incredible vision, but... He misunderstood and thought, oh, wow, that's what it's all about. You just want to use me. And I think a lot of people that go to church feel that way. They feel like pastors just want to use them, okay, for your tithe and for your service and so forth. But here's the deal, is I said, no, son, actually, uh, you know, you know that's ridiculous. He said, oh, I know now it is ridiculous. But I said, you know what? I didn't ever have you do the dishes for me. I had you do the dishes for you. Because if I failed to have you do the dishes, you would never become the man that you're called to be. See, responsibility is not about me exploiting you. Responsibility is about you having a context in which you can grow. And if I fail to deliver that to you, I'm actually robbing you of true developmental processes. You guys understand that? So we must, in a family context, go ahead and really provide opportunities of growing responsibility. We just need to make sure the responsibilities are at least in some degree tied to the development, developmental design of the individual. Now, sometimes I will put somebody in a context of responsibility that's diverse from their calling, but I'll do it as a remedial step. So, hey, you know, you're called to pastor adults, well, I'm going to put you in children's church for a year or for six months because if you can pastor children, you can pastor anybody. You know what I mean? So I'll recommend that or I'll recommend something else and I'll say, here's a couple of options for you. 
And I will almost in every case, in every church I've worked in and in every church I counsel, say you should always have a set of sort of the low-end responsibilities that everybody who's on the journey of development in your midst can engage for a season, not permanently, but for a season while they're on their journey into the next level that will hopefully be more and increasingly aligned with their ultimate calling in God. You guys understand that? Okay, and then finally, destiny, which is determining that calling of God. And, you know, and again, we talked about destiny before, but destiny really is the, based in the belief that is you know, expressed in, in uh, Psalm 139, where he says, you know, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, O God. My soul knows it quite well. You know, my form was not hidden from you when I was made in secret in the lower parts of the earth. I don't know why that, you know, the lower parts of the earth is a belly, but, um, and then he says, and all my days were written out for me when as yet there were none of them. Yes. Okay, or as it says that, you know, that you were chosen in him, or, he, you know, according to the purpose of him who, who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Are you chosen in him before the foundations of the world? Or Ephesians 2.10, you know, that we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. And there's a little bit of a tension between the whole idea of predestination and destiny. Yes. Okay, because we're, you know, most charismatics tend not to be uh, reformed. We tend not to be Calvinists. Okay, so we tend to be on the other side of the uh, pe spectrum. There's basically two sort of warring perspectives on the sovereignty of God. One, one is traditionally, and I'm, I'm epitomizing now, so please give me some latitude, but, but you know, Calvinism basically says that God is like a computer programmer who programmed it all at the beginning of time and then pushed return, and it's all happening without, without interruption, okay? And he's responsible for everything because he's a sovereign God. Okay, but, you know, we as maybe, you know, non-Calvinists or Arminian in our perspective would say, no, actually God in his sovereignty gave humanity free will and we make choices. And, and the extreme ex example of that would be like open theism that s says that God really doesn't know the choices you're going to make. So he sits at the end of time and is kind of surprised, like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. But actually we know that's ridiculous too, right? And so, so you know, the, the extreme Arminianism is ridiculous and the extreme Calvinism is ridiculous. And I believe that the real problem between the two is that really, actually, God's truth isn't really on the line, the continuum between the two. In fact, I, I have this theory, okay, that the real problem is not a problem of is God sovereign or not, or, or does God determine things or not, but actually the problem is a misunderstanding of the nature of time. Okay, that God does not exist in time. And so therefore, and we do, we're trapped in time. So we're like, we're like basically, you, you, you see a keyboard up here, 88 keys on the keyboard, and we're trapped in the chromatic scale. Ba, 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 but God's not. God actually is like a pianist, and he cracks his fingers, and he has 100 fingers on each hand. And he can sit down at the piano of time, and he can play the low notes and the high notes at the same moment. You guys get that? And so he's able actually to, to, to touch you as you're sitting in your mother's womb right now in his time. He can touch you in your mother's womb right now. He can touch you when you went to kindergarten for the first day. He can, when you graduated from high school, and he can touch you right now, and he can touch you 20 years from now. Okay, because God is outside of time, but he interacts with all time at the same time in his time. You guys understand that? So therefore, he is able to work all things according to the counsel of his own will because if you play a wrong note, he can actually overplay that note because he's got a finger that's, that's, that's aimed towards your mistake and it can actually redeem that note and produce an outcome that's greater because God is big and he's awesome and he's greater than time. Time is a construct. It sits like a, a, little, a little toy in his hand and so he's able to interact with all time at the same time because in his time, he's outside of time. Okay, so he's able to both be absolutely sovereign and still law, allow a certain limited sovereignty of human choice and yet still override that choice when necessary when he chooses to. Yeah. And so he can indeed work all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Okay, and so that's the kind of environment we're in, but I only have a few more minutes, so I'm just going to race through this. So how do we produce maximum growth environment? Okay, so where am I? Did I just mess this up again? Okay, come on. Okay. Huh. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's out of order, but that's okay. Let's just, let's just go on. Um, is that it? 
Okay, great. So how to create a maximum growth environment for emerging leaders? Yes. Okay, so the first thing is discovery. You need to um, help people discover, and you need to discover with them their God-given design. And so that means you spend time with them and you process with them. I hear everybody's life story. I, I hear their significant issues in their life. I hear what were the formative experiences of their lives. Because I want to be able to guide them effectively into the glory of God in their lives. And I need to know who they are in order to do that. And so I spend time in that discovery process, discovering their design, their dream, and the destiny of each leader. I also want definition. I have to define the pathways and the expectations. I believe one of the biggest mistakes that that leaders make is that they don't define either their expectations or find out the expectations of those that they're leading. And so what happens is that's where most of the pain comes into relationships is misplaced expectations. And so it's essential for us to define the expectations. Whenever I bring somebody to a higher level of leadership, I will always have an interview with them and talk about that issue. And I will ask certain questions like, am I your pastor? And somebody will say, oh yeah, of course you're the pastor of the church. And I'll say, no, that's not the question I asked. I asked, am I your pastor? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, do I have permission to speak into your life? Because if I don't, I probably shouldn't even have you in this leadership position because we won't be able to resolve conflict together. You see what I'm saying? I mean, just that simple question alone is so powerful and it just, it just you know, sort of uh, preempts a thousand problems in the future of your relationship with people. You guys understand that? So defining your relationship, do a DTR. You know, figure it out, you guys. You know, it's like walking together with people is challenging. Okay, communication. Regular feedback loops are essential to growth in a healthy team. So I would commit, in my core team of, of seven people, I met with them weekly. Okay, in the secondary layer of leadership, I met with them at least every other week. And in my third layer of leadership, it was at least once every six weeks. Because I wanted to have a continuous feedback loop helping people to grow in Christ unto the call of God in their lives. Okay, then correction. You must have permission to speak into the life of emerging leaders. And that doesn't mean that you have the, the authority or the permission to abuse them or to be harsh with them unnecessarily. You still need to come in that spirit of love. The scripture says that love will cover a multitude to transgressions. Uh, Galatians chapter 6 says, if you overtake your brother in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So it's essential for us to correct appropriately, but we also need to bring ample affirmation. We must enthusiastically celebrate every victory, no matter how small. And if you don't celebrate the victories, you are robbing yourself of accumulative momentum. Because ultimately, momentum is a product of many little successes and the degree to which you celebrate the successes of the individual and the success of that impact of that individual on the overall church I'll tell you something it has power now I, I went to a, my first staff meeting I ever went to at Bethel I, I just happened to be invited so I went into their staff meeting I was still pastoring in San Francisco at the time and uh, they had an hour and a half meeting and literally an hour and 15 minutes were testimonies of what God's doing they just did testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony and then they had 15 minutes for business and they relegated it all to the lower departments and walked out of the room. And I thought, how do they get anything done in this church? But they all left the meeting feeling a lot more happy than I used to leave, leave, leave my elders' meetings. You know what I mean? It's like they all had, like the, I mean, they were, they were generating momentum because they were celebrating all the goodness of God and the good things that God was doing. And they kind of let the, let the problems take care of themselves. That, that, that was instructive to me. Okay, so here we are then. Whoops. I'm going to go bam. Okay, so how to troubleshoot obstacles in the leadership development process. I'm working with people to try to help them fulfill their God-given destiny. And in so doing, I'm trying to, to bring them into relationship with the organization so that their pursuit of their destiny is actually reflecting back or, or profiting the organization in a powerful way. You guys understand? You can't put one above the other in a way that excludes the other because you'll actually damage both. But if I can bring the two together in dynamic synergy, the organizational destiny and the individual destiny, that's where the payoff is. You guys get that? So as I'm looking towards that, I'm seeing, let's say, challenges and issues in a person's life. One of the things I have to do is I have to diagnose those problems. I have to be able to correct those problems. And so what I look at initially is I look at the fact of uh, there's five areas that I have here. And I, I shared those a couple days ago, but I don't know if all of you were there. But it's basically five W's. Okay, so it's wiring, wounding, will, warfare, and the final one is whatever. 
Okay, and wiring is just the issue of how has God made this person? Because maybe I'm trying to fit a, a, a round peg in a square hole. And a lot of pastors are doing that, and, and all of a sudden people get burnt out and blown out. But really it was just a misapplication of the person's identity with the, with the, with the task they were asked to perform. Okay, so I need to understand the people I'm leading in a way where I know I'm matching them as closely as I can to the, to the responsibilities that would most cause them to thrive. Because I believe that people will never be happy until they're doing God's will. And so I, I operate under a presumption that every single person must do God's will. In other words, I believe that you will never be as fulfilled as when you're fulfilling the will of God for your life. Okay, and that means sacrifice. I don't believe you can ever be fulfilled just sitting in a pew. I believe you will eventually become unhappy. I think it's guaranteed that you will because we were not designed to simply be receivers. We are designed to be givers. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And if I don't hold that in my heart, I'm not, I have no intention of manipulating or exploiting anybody, but I just know for, I don't have you do my dishes for my sake. I have you do my dishes for your sake. Okay, you guys get that? And so, so basically the... Uh, the quick conclusion of that particular story, the thing I like to say is that if I don't have you clean up your toys when you're three years old, then you won't make your bed when you're five years old. And you won't clear the table when you're seven. And you won't uh, you know, mow the lawn when you're 12. And you won't drive a car when you're 16. You won't graduate from college. And you'll end up actually as a 30-year-old living in my basement in your underwear playing video games all day long. <laughs> you guys understand that? But the reality is that is what happens in church that we have people that are believers for 10, 15, 20 years and they're literally playing video church every Sunday. You know, they're not doing anything. They're just learning more and just, just you know, moving the little things around. But they're not actually changing the world because they, and partly because they haven't been led correctly. Okay, so what we want to do is change that reality. So we have to look at wiring, identify the current capacity, and prescribe a growth plan for your leaders. If they're wired a certain way, that doesn't mean they can't grow. Or Ephesians uh, 4 is not a, is not a true... Uh, Scripture. Because the scripture says that we can actually be equipped to do the work of the ministry. So I need, if I'm limited in my ability to do ministry in one way or the other, I can actually be around people who have gifting that is contrast to, to my limitation, and they can expand me in that direction. You guys understand? So wiring is not a, a death sentence. Wiring is just a, a current limitation that can be grown upon. You can add wires. Splice them in. Okay, the next thing is wounding. Identify past hurts, disappointments, regrets that need healing. Because every one of us gets wounded in life. Life is tough, you guys. And so, but, but a lot of us have different responses. Some of us crumble under the wounding of life. Others of us become defiant. Others of us shut down and become uh, calloused. Yeah, we all have different responses, but all of us need healing from time to time. And so what we want to do is if somebody's hit a roadblock in their growth and their development, I want to understand, is there a wound here that needs to be addressed? Is there, is there wiring limited? Is there wounding there? Or is it just a will issue? Is it a pride issue or a, um, a choice issue that a person's making and a stubbornness in their character? I want to be able to address that. But the solution to the wounding is healing. The solution to will is repentance. So again, the problem is that oftentimes as pastors were, pre were prescribing the wrong medication for the problem. And so we'll say, oh, you have a wiring problem? Well, get healed. No, it doesn't work that way. You need to grow. If you have a wounding problem, well, you need to repent. No, actually, you probably just need to get healed. But you have a will problem, well, you need to get healed. No, you need to repent. It's like we need to prescribe the right solution to the right problem to actually expedite the process of development in the people we're leading. And then finally, warfare, that we need to identify strongholds and assignments that need breakthrough, and then we need to go after those things. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the final section. Turn with me in your Bibles, and we have about, oh, five more minutes. Hallelujah! Thank you, Jesus. So turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Timothy. I, I, I just love this passage. I don't have a chance to show you my secret sauce, but that's okay. Because that means you have to come have me back. Yeah. That it's going to be like a, it's going to be like a job uh, insurance for the future. I'll come back and be with you guys again. But anyway, um, okay. So here's Timothy, 2 Timothy, one of the most powerful passages on uh, multi-generational leadership development and reproduction, and also one of the most powerful passages on the concept of concentricity, because I believe in concentricity. I'll just show you this. I believe that Jesus built concentrically. You know, he had Jesus, he had the three, he had the nine, he had the 
12, well actually 12 was the 3 plus the 9. He had 70 and then he had 120 on the day of Pentecost. He had 500 that saw him ascend. Jesus built his, his framework concentrically and I believe it was on purpose. Because basically Paul's saying the same thing exactly here. Let me read it to you. It says, Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit this to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here we have the apostle Paul, we have Timothy, we have faithful men, and we have others also. Okay? So we have four generations of leadership development that he identifies in this process. You guys see it? Okay, and so I believe that a key to effective leadership development is to create con- concentricity. Okay, and so if we look at it like this, if we look at it, okay, this is somebody comes to us at this level of leadership development. My goal is to have them up here, but nobody can jump that high. So I have to create successive levels of involvement that would actually produce the outcome of their development at that level. So if I want to bring people up into greater and greater maturity and greater and greater fruitfulness in Christ, I have to have a plan of development for those individuals. So part of that is helping people to move from one layer of of maturity, one layer of responsibility, one layer of of destiny to the next layer so that they can actually ultimately become more and more Christ-like. So I believe that this is like the architecture of the local church. The only thing I would add to it is this, boom, boom, boom which is if I put A and P and E and P and T, okay, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, I believe that there are are different uh, dimensions of involvement, different spheres of involvement that actually can become part of the pathway that people are on depending on who they are, where they come from, and how they move. The only exception I would say, and I'm, I'm cramming a lot in right now, so please forgive me, but I would say out in the outer rings of involvement are people who's just getting involved. The specialization is not that important. As a military person, you move from being a generalist to a specialist. As a medical doctor, you move from being a generalist to a specialist. I believe that in the kingdom we do as well. You know, somebody who's six months old in the Lord and wants to express their apostolic gifting, I think might be a little premature. In fact, when I had my first prophecy about being an apostle, the guy said, well, you know, 25 years from now, you might start to touch it. You know? Now, I was always apostolic, but to function as an apostle is a different animal. You know what I mean? And some of you are already prophetic, but you may not be ordainable as prophets yet. You see what I'm saying? And so how do, we, how do we graph that? Well, we have to actually create developmental criteria for people to move forward in Christ into the fullness of who God has called them to be. Let me just finish with this little passage. I'll give two more minutes on this, and then we're done. He says, and the things you've heard from me verse 2, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Therefore, you must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engages in warfare entangles himself in the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So he he gives us the example of a soldier. Now, no one who's a soldier entangles himself in the affairs of this life. I mean, most of us in this room are so entangled, it's hard for us to get free enough to serve Jesus, okay? But he's saying, no, you've got to make this a priority. You've got to say, hey, if if I'm a soldier, that's my top priority, to serve my commander. Okay, the second thing he says is, is if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he completes according to the rules. So there is a constitution to this thing. There is a set of rules that govern the way that we're supposed to serve and be and so forth. And we have this amazing book called the Bible that, that really explains and ex- explicitly declares all these things that really apply to us. And you've got to play according to the rules. You can't make up your own rules. And that's why it's so frustrating in our day and age because there's so many people out there coming up with these little pet doctrines that are so, you know, crazy. Anyway, but finally, he talks about this. He says, and the hardworking farmer is the first partaker of the crops. And I believe that in leadership, see, it's interesting. Have you, have you noticed soldier? Do your job. Athlete, play according to the rules. Farmer, eat the crops. Do you notice the mismatch there? Isn't that interesting? That a farmer would be the, he could say, farmer, plow the ground well. But he doesn't say that. He says, farmer, eat the crops. Because I believe that in every family expression of church, there must be an ROI for everyone who's participating. You guys know what an ROI is? Return on investment. 
We're asking people to pour their lives out for Jesus, and we've got to make sure that we give them a return on their investment. If we're asking them to sacrifice with us, I mean, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. There was a joy set. What's the joy set before you? And as, as you are a leader in whatever ministry you're leading in or whatever family you're leading or whatever marketplace expression you're in, what is your ROI for the people that you're asking to sacrifice for your cause? I believe that part of the key to mobilizing people in our generation is making sure that the ROI is there. You say, well, that's selfish. Well, why is it in the Bible? See, I believe that God motivates us through reward. Can I take one more minute? David, uh, no, it wasn't David Wilkerson. It was actually Ralph uh, Bruce Wilkinson who wrote The Prayer of Jabez. Okay, remember that book? Okay, he, he actually did a thing beforehand called Walk Through the Bible. Anybody ever go through Walk Through the Bible uh, once upon a time? Okay, well, part of Walk Through the Bible, he actually did a study of every commandment in the Old Testament and the New Testament to try to determine what was God's motivational base in those commandments. And he came up with a rough, I'm just going to give you the rough figure. He had actually an exact figure. But out of all the commandments in the Bible, 85% of them were motivated by reward. If you do this, I will do this for you. About 10% were motivated by fear. If you don't do this, I'll do this to you. <laughs> and the final little bit was motivated by love. If you just love me, do it. Okay? So about 5%. And then he asked a trick question. He says, well, what do you think it is in the New Testament? And the, the common answer is, oh, it must be love. He says, actually, no, it's the exact same percentages. That in the New Testament, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. In other words, God always motivates or mostly motivates by reward. And then a little bit more about fear. And then finally, love is the motivator. At about 85, 10, and 5%. How are you motivating people within your world of leadership? And are you delivering on the promise of reward that you're making to induce people to serve according to the plan that you've given them? Because I believe that's one of the things that is missing in many churches and something that we have to nail. Again, not to foster selfishness, but I believe it actually speaks of the way that God actually made humanity. That we are men and women who are created to be reward-based. Sowing and reaping, farming the crops and eating the crops is our destiny. So stand up with me. Let's close. I'd like everybody to come close. Come close again. And, um, and uh, I'd like to just pray a prayer of impartation that you guys can all put your strategic thinking caps on for the next season of leadership in your life. And hopefully, like, I mean, we didn't thoroughly complete the notes, but here's the deal, is hopefully you saw a way of approaching leadership in a ministry context that actually... Um, has a sense of clarity about it and has uh, uh, the possibility of producing the outcomes we're longing for. And so my hope is, is that as we do this, that you guys will all um, be able to start applying a different set of thoughts mm -hmm. to how you lead, yeah. whether it's in the home or whether it's in the marketplace or whether it's in the church setting, different ministries or even church leadership. So... Um, so, but before we pray, I just feel like I have a word for you, Pastor Greg. Um, I feel like there's, there's something about Zechariah 4 for you. I don't know if you're familiar with the passage, but it's probably one of the precursor passages to the apostle gift. And I think it also applies to Dawn as well, to your, you and your wife together. Because there's a vision that he has of two olive trees. And there's pipes coming out of the olive tree. And the pipes are going straight into a candelabra and they're burning the oil. <laughs> and Zechariah says, what does that mean? No, actually the angel says, do you know what that means? He says, no, I don't have a clue. <laughs> and he says, it means it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And you say, okay, well, how does that mean that? How does pipes coming out of an olive tree filling a candelabra mean it's not by might nor by power but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And then he says this amazing thing. He says, who are you, O mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain and they shall bring forth the capstone and place it in its place at the head of the temple and they'll shout, grace, grace, grace did this. 
And he says, he goes on to say that your hands have laid a foundation and your hands will complete it. Hallelujah. And then it goes on to say that everyone will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. And this is such an apostolic scripture. Such an apostolic scripture. Zechariah is prophesying over the governor, Zerubbabel, who was in the line of Jesus, yeah. declaring that every, all the eyes will, will rejoice. Mm. And there's eyes on a stone in the previous passage, so it's a little bit about that. But it's like, and then he goes on to say, and these two olive trees, mm-hmm. you know, stand in the presence of the Lord. Mm. I would just encourage you to, to spend some time in that passage, just meditating on it. Yeah. But how does it mean not by might nor by power? Because the human way of doing this is that we collect the berries, we shake the tree, the berries fall, we gather them up, we grind them, and we pulverize them, and then the oil flows to the top. We take the oil, we refine it over three or four refine, refining processes, and then we take that oil and bring it to the temple, and we put it in the candelabra, and it burns. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of work. A lot of work. Yeah. But the Lord says, it's not by might, mm. nor by power. Amen. It's like I feel like God has given you human strategies, brilliant mind. He's given you intentionality. He's given you a strategic perspective, but he's also given you a tremendous, tremendous measure of Holy Spirit reality. And I believe those two things are the key to what God wants to do, not just in this church, but through Ascend International University, the Ascend Network. I believe that you're going to lead a charge into an integration that is going to produce a transformation in the world around us. So I just want to bless you with that as we close. So thank you, Jesus. And um, thank you, Jesus. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, we just present ourselves to you right now. And, Father, this... This man as the, as the head of this church, as the, the leader of this uh, school, Lord, right now I just bless you. And I bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I bless the apostolic gifting, the apostolic mindset, the apostolic strategies, and the apostolic clarity. Mm. And I just bless the journey you've been on. I bless all that has happened up to this time. And I just declare a future that is greater than the past that, mm. that God has blessed you in. And right now, I just pray, Father, that you begin to unload it. I just see like a a card file with cards just flashing past of all that the Lord intends and all that he wants to do in this coming season and all of the strategic impact that you'll have in this community and all of the men and women who will come to you saying, I long to know my destiny. Please unlock it with me and help me to become the person that God's called me to be. I just bless you with that. And in the name of Jesus, I bless everyone here. Can you just put a hand on somebody and just bless them now? Father, release apostolic wisdom across the board here, Lord. Release the power of apostolic clarity, of apostolic servant leadership, Father. Let every one of these men and women adopt a heart, Lord, that embraces the culture and embraces the vision, embraces the values, embraces the priority, Lord, that you would release upon each one of them a a sense of, of unity and power together to build something that will blow the minds of this community, Lord, that you would actually release a house, that they would come and they would say, grace, grace to this house, as the capstone comes on. Grace, grace did this, that it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit declares the Lord of hosts. And we declare, Father, that you are welcome here to guide every person in this team into a place of incredible exponential fruitfulness. In the name of Jesus, I declare it. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we say thank you to Michael. Let's give him a big hand. You will be invited back. (laughs) Lord willing, it all works out for everybody. But in my heart, I I think that we have some more AIU classes with Michael Brozier. What do you all think, huh? Amen. (laughs) 